Greetings, everyone. You'll have to excuse me. I think I'm losing my voice, but we'll have to make do with that. I'm speaking with John Dewar, and we've received a few questions that are kind of interesting, and every so often we do like to take the questions on and answer them in our conversations. And I think that's something of interest to most people. And a lot of the times these questions may have nothing or very little to do with the subjects that we talk about, but in the overall picture, I believe that they are relevant. Everything is relevant to what we're doing. So we're going to answer four questions. And the first one was to do with persecution, spiritual warfare, fasting, and prayer. And I was going to start by asking John, what does he think about persecution? I presume we'd be talking about persecution of believers today, and there's different levels in different countries, so we'd have to be a little bit more specific about what we mean by that. But spiritual warfare, that is universal in the sense that that's happening everywhere, and fasting and prayer are two things that we do read about in the Bible a lot. Prayer is something we all know what that means. Fasting, very few of us do that. So I'm going to ask John what he thinks of these four things to start with, starting with persecution. As far as persecution goes, we know that Scripture says all who live godly in Jesus shall suffer persecution. I'm quoting it from the best of my memory. So if you're a Christian, you're going to be persecuted. There's a 100% guarantee there. Persecution can vary, very, you know, to great degrees. Uh, persecution could be just being isolated from groups of people that you would normally want to associate with all the way through being killed. Um, I would have to say most real Christians that I know uh, suffer persecution through uh, not being welcomed at certain churches or being ostracized because of the Bible that they choose or the beliefs that they have. I'm going to comment for myself. Um, you know, I've talked about in the past that uh, I've had a number of people make threats to me uh, in writing, uh, very rarely to my face, but I have had that happen. Uh, I have had devils show up at my church and in my house. Uh, people that I associate with that I love as Christians have had devils show up in their house, so we've cast them out in Jesus' name. Uh, I have, uh, you know, had, uh, you know, a lot of people try to undermine my efforts for what I do to spread the gospel, whether it's through the film series that I produced or through my responsibilities as a pastor at a church or through the outreach uh, efforts such as YouTube, our collaboration, Reg. So uh, that's a very concise feedback of persecution, and I know of people throughout your the world through missionaries that I hear that are, you know, persecuted for being Christians, uh, uh, afflicted, thrown into prison, sometimes killed. Uh, a lot of this escapes our media, and we aren't very sensitive to it, but outside of our comfortable uh, zone of the U.S. media, there is a lot of persecution worldwide. I've had the opportunity to spend a lot of time outside the United States, and uh, I've seen the oppression. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's very disturbing. John, like you, I've received quite a bit of persecution, mainly in the form of name-calling and people attacking me in various ways through YouTube and uh, sending me emails and that sort of thing. I have never suffered the kind of persecution that the first century church suffered. That, to me, is the real persecution. But most of the persecution that I've encountered, oddly, has come from within the so-called church community. It's people who come against me and rail at me, call me names, threaten me, curse me, and all kinds of things, and call themselves Christians. And, I mean, that's a subject for an entirely different conversation, but that is where I get most of the so-called persecution from. And I was recently studying what goes on in the West Bank, that is in Israel, and the Palestinian Christians, which were in Bethlehem alone, that was 80% of the population, was Christian at one time. And they have been persecuted 
and killed and their land taken. And this all started with Zionism. Now, we don't hear about that, but these Christians were and are still being severely persecuted, all in the name of this battle, so-called for the land of Israel and the Zionist movement. And that's a different subject altogether. But as far as we in America are concerned, the persecution we suffer is mild. And Jesus really said, you should be glad for the persecution because it means you are truly his followers, because you will suffer persecution if you are a follower. You will not if you are of the world. And that leads us to the next question about spiritual warfare. John, that's something that you and I know quite a bit about and have experienced. I have seen devils. They have appeared. You have seen them. We know they're real. We know that there are people that are involved in all kinds of occult practices, witchcraft, and all kinds of things that pray against people like you and I, John, and others. And we have experienced the reality of that. Isn't that true? Absolutely. I could go ahead and comment if you wish, but I am very aware of my surroundings, the dark spiritual realm that blankets this earth, and the people that are under a delusion in serving, you know, a a false god. And uh, I have experienced many uh, occasions of uh, spirits that have either appeared or tried to torment me or my family. Seen things, and you know, I could go on for hours, but uh, that would make most people literally uh, break down. So, but Jesus talks about all this stuff. You know, you need not look any further than the Bible. And there's people that you know, he cast out many devils from people. And uh, you know, God tells us the nature of these spiritual attacks can be very subtle, and they can be, you know, in people that at first appearance. Uh, appear to be good, sincere people. Um, one that comes to mind is the damsel that was possessed with, uh, I think it was a spirit of divination, where she was making a lot of money for her masters, mm-hmm. and she announced, uh, those are the men that serve the Most High God. I'm paraphrasing, I'm going from memory, but, you know, uh, that kind of reveals to me in Scripture the nature of people who are possessed. A lot of times does not uh, go with the Hollywood version of people that are possessed where their eyes are rolled back and they're spewing vomit out of their mouth and they're floating around. You know, a lot of people that are under spiritual attacks or or who are possessed by devils can be some of the most beloved people in their outward appearance and be the best smooth talkers in the Christian entertainment forum. So, and that's, that's a concise response on that subject. I would say to people that are concerned about spiritual warfare, there's a couple of things that I am very aware of. Number one, I need to be walking in the Spirit 24-7. I need to be led by the Holy Spirit, not allowing myself to get involved in carnal things, in any kind of wickedness, and or anything at all like that, and the Lord is constantly bringing these things to my mind, that we must give the devil no foothold. And, of course, that leads to the next question about prayer and fasting. And prayer is your primary stronghold when it comes to spiritual warfare. And I know you know that, I know that. You and I have been in prayer constantly for various things, We are praying for people that ask us to pray for them, not that the fact that you and I pray has any particular power. It is the power of God that we trust, and we obey that commandment, if you like, to bring things to God in prayer. And so, we have seen some wonderful things happen in people's lives because of prayer. So, we know the power of that, and it covers a multitude of sins, and it does block the devil in so many ways. So, what are your comments about prayer, John? And then perhaps just mention fasting as well. My comments on prayer. Prayer is very personal between the individual believer and God. Some people are convicted differently than others. I'm going to give my personal conviction. I have never been convicted to make long, ongoing prayers uh, to God. When I pray, I say what I mean, and I, I ask God with bold confidence, 
says, because we know whatsoever we ask in the name of Jesus Christ shall be given to us. I ask him for what my needs are, boldly and with great confidence, and I ask him once or maybe twice. I don't continue to pray and pray over and over again for the same thing. However, I do know some sincere Christians that do that, and it's a matter of your personal conviction. I was raised Catholic, so, you know, the Bible says don't pray like the heathen in vain repetitions, for they think they'll be heard for much speaking. Um, so I just say what I need to say to God with bold confidence. I ask everything in Jesus' name, and uh, and then I move on. And I, as a pastor, have a lot of prayer requests on our church prayer list, but I tell everybody, let's pray for things and mean it, and then take them off the list and move on, because they're heard. We know they're heard. You don't have to sit there and pray over and over and over, but I give people an opportunity if they want something to be retained on the prayer list so that a group of people continue to pray about it. That's fine. Just let me know. But uh, that's that's my take on prayer, that as Christians, we know we have the Holy Spirit in us. And because the Holy Spirit is in us, there is a, a constant conviction that whatsoever we can ask, whatever our needs and petitions are, they're going to be heard. And so the Holy Spirit is keeping us you know, praying all the time. I mean, we've got God on our mind constantly because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When it comes to fasting, I have matured in my understanding of this. At first, you know, fasting to me was just simply physical, the physical abstention from, you know, food and drink or, or, or whatever. And, uh, you know, at times I have gone through what I would say, you know, some levels of fasting. However, uh, fasting to me has a spiritual meaning as well, and that is, you know, fasting is making sure that you do an examination of your faith, that you're not feeding on iniquity or feeding on false doctrine, that you're, you're not uh, filling yourself with uh, the doctrine of men, but rather you take a step back and you pray and just ask the Holy Spirit to guide you into what God wants for you to do. So there is a physical fasting and there is a spiritual fasting, and I think both are being directed at the Christians by God. And so what I choose to do is always go back to Scripture on things and not feed on, I'll just say, the, the bread of iniquity as it is mentioned in Proverbs. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but, you know, you, you have to feed on the correct doctrine of God in order to please God. You have to have faith. And so that, that's my comment on fasting. I, I put more credence on the spiritual than I do the physical. That's my personal conviction. I must say that I have never fasted physically. I've never felt compelled to do it. I know what it is. I've thought about it, but I never have. So I am not qualified to comment on that aspect. However, on the spiritual aspect of it, I'm very, very well acquainted with what John has just said, and we are feeding on spiritual things, and when we fast, we are fasting off, that is, we are abstaining from the carnal things. And so there is two aspects to that. It's not to deny that there is such a thing as physical fasting. We know that Jesus did that. And we know that the scripture says there is a benefit from that. And so if the Holy Spirit is leading you to physically fast, I think you will know that and you should do that. But we're not to neglect the things that affect us on a very deep spiritual level. And that is the doctrine we feed on. Do we feed on the Word of God or do we feed on wormwood? Are we feeding on that rotten meat that the birds of prey eat, carcasses and things like that that are spoken of in the Old Testament? So we want to be clear on that. He washed it 